Welcome to Pencil Leadership. I'm Chris Anderson, success and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I'm on a mission to help you realize your full potential so you can leave a positive mark on the world. So if you're ready, take out your pencils and let's begin. And if you want to make a difference in the lives of others, share this episode, go over to Apple Podcasts and follow us there to leave a positive rating and review. And together we can leave a bigger positive mark on the world. Welcome back to Pencil Leadership. Super excited to have this episode put out there for you. Everyone probably have realized that there are some changes going on in the world around us. We're going through some different things nowadays, and we're learning how to adapt and live with and improve all through these changes. And so today's guest is going to really help give us some good guidance and direction for us personally to just adapt to a changing world. So today we have Jerry Valentine on the show today. Now, Jerry is a public speaker. He's an executive coach and a writer. He has an extensive background in Fortune 100 companies and things like that through advising and other means. Just a lot of expertise and a lot of good value he's going to be bringing to the show today. So we're just going to pick his brain about how we can adapt in this ever-changing world that we're in. Jerry, welcome to Pencil Leadership. Hey, Chris. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. No problem. Looking forward to this. But before we do that, just kind of maybe give a high level to those listening about yourself and why you like to talk about this topic of adaptation in a changing world. Sure. The way I often put it is, why does disruption and adversity cause some people to break and other people to break records? And what I'm interested in is creating more people who break records rather than are broken. So if my background, which you spoke to a little bit, is that I started out as a corporate executive. I spent 27 years in companies like American Express and Pfizer leading different corporate functions. And you know, today I run my own business, which is Vision Executive Coaching. I'm an executive coach. I'm a public speaker. I'm an author. And you know, it's really been a great experience for me, but it's also a very typical experience when you think about where I came from. I started out as the son of a single mother growing up in a very low-income neighborhood in New York City. And I left that life. I was very lucky to leave that life to go on to earn an Ivy League degree, followed by an MBA and ultimately my Fortune 100 career. I sometimes refer to my story as my 6% story, because if you look at the statistics, an African-American man starting out where I did has approximately a 6% probability of having the life I lead today. And one of the things I realized during my corporate career, which was, you know, intended to be with really demanding companies, really competitive work environments, but the thing that I brought to the environment, possibly more than most of my peers, was this ability to thrive through disruptive times. And I realized that, oh, the reason I can do that is because that's what I've been doing my entire life. When I went on to lead other people, I found that I could actually teach them the skills that I had for thriving through disruptive times, even if there were people who looked very different from me and might have come from very different backgrounds. And now the business I run is about helping people thrive through disruptive times. And I work with corporate executives. I work with entrepreneurs and what I call high performance individuals of all kinds and helping them learn how to thrive through disruptive times and lead others to thrive through disruptive times as well. It's so cool to just kind of hear that high level of your story and just seeing that you've been able to come through those, you know, adversities, those obstacles and succeed and be where you are now is just a really cool thing. It's motivating for me. I love hearing those stories and I find it interesting. I mean, I've done over 140 episodes now on this show and I would say a high percentage of these guests like yourself that have interviewed these successful individuals, they've had some sort of obstacle in their past, some sort of thing that, you know, they might have had to get through or they had to get around or, but that seemed to be the thing that propelled them into their success. There's a tie to it. And I just find that fascinating. I'm sure you've heard, I mean, the obstacles, the way kind of thing. And so with your story, you kind of attest to that, like you were able to get out of that lifestyle, the 6% impacted you in a positive way going forward. So with people who are maybe going through a bunch of change, and now or having a lot of change in their life, negative, positive, whatever it is, mm -hmm. how do we even start thinking about yeah. adapting? This is the crux of it. And, you know, I wonder as you speak about this and the commonalities between the people you've had on the show, if this is maybe what's at the root of it. 
I think that certainly as a country and as a society, broader human society, perhaps, we do a terrible job of preparing people for change and disruption. But change and disruption is the way of life. Like right now, we're talking about COVID and all the changes brought on by COVID. But this is one of the things I talk about in my book. Even before COVID, we were living through one of the most disruptive times in human history. So we have technology that's advancing. We have you know, incredible tools and technology like artificial intelligence, big data, which lead to amazing capabilities, but can also be used poorly. We have an, a more interconnected society through social media, and we have a more interconnected world, a globalized society. So we're no longer, you know, no longer makes sense to think about yourself as only competing with those in the United States or those geographically nearby. We now live in a global community. So these are all forces of change that are underway. I think about COVID, not to minimize the terrible impacts that this has had on so many people, but it's an accelerator. What We were already going through this incredibly disruptive time. You encounter something like COVID, and it actually just accelerates the change and the disruption that was already underway. So I think the key is how do we better prepare people to deal with disruption? And I think that's the key to thriving. I call it the thriving mindset. And my book is the thriving mindset tools for empowerment in a disruptive world. And I think that's how you empower people. You prepare them to thrive in a disruptive world. You train them that disruption is the normal. Mm -hmm. It's not something to be feared. It's something to be embraced. Yeah. I think that's a great statement there. And it's like I've heard in the past, you know, adapt or die if we want to be really brash with it. But like, it's true. I mean, you think even back through history, all the changes that happened, and in those moments, it took people to adapt and to figure things out, to move, you know, the rest forward, you know, the leaders yeah, to, exactly. who could adapt. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, one of the things I talk about in my book is I draw a parallel with what's going on now in the Industrial Revolution. So we typically think of the Industrial Revolution as something that brought, you know, incredible advances in human knowledge, incredible advances in technology and medicine and many, many things, refrigeration, all kinds of things we take for granted today. And we think about the Industrial Revolution as lifting millions of people out of poverty and extending and enhancing human lifespans. All of those things are true. But if you shrink the timeline and look at what was going on during that period, you see sweatshops, you see child labor, you see millions of people living in poverty. You see rural communities that were decimated by industrialization. So when you shrink the aperture to a much smaller slice of time, you see this type of disruption, very negative disruption that went on until society caught up with the negative aspects of the types of change that were going on. There's a model I give people to think about disruption, and it is kind of at the core of what I believe, because I think it's what causes so many people to be broken rather than to break records. And I call it the adversity fear paralysis cycle, and this is how it works. So when faced with a disruption or some type of adversity, which is just a normal part of life, the natural response is fear. And it's the fear that we may not be equal to whatever the challenges of the disruption are. Now, it, the problem is not the fear itself. It's a process that I call paralysis, which is an unproductive response to the disruption. And the problem with paralysis is that it always leads to more disruption. It either makes the initial worse or brings a new disruption along with it. And one of my favorite examples is Kodak, which was a company that went bankrupt in 2012, but had been in business for a century. Now, for most people, when I raise this, you would say, well, the reason was digital photography. But what most people don't know is that Kodak invented the first digital camera back in 1975. Did you know oh, that? I did not know that. <laughs> most people do not know that. The first digital camera was invented by an engineer named Steve Sasson. And one would think, well, how could this happen? How could a company be undone by its own invention? And it's that adversity fear paralysis cycle that hit. So when faced with the disruption of a new technology, Kodak's leaders, who were men who only need the film business, 
allowed their fear of change to prevent them from leveraging their own invention. So Sasson was interviewed by the New York Times several years ago, and he spoke about what it was like at Kodak when he came forward with this invention. And he could basically get no one to listen to him. And it's easy to understand if you look at it through one lens. So those of us who were old enough to have been around back in the day when we used film cameras, you know, you often took your pictures in Kodak cameras on Kodak film, which you took to the drugstore to be developed in Kodak chemicals. And then in about a week, you went to get your prints on what? Kodak Kodak paper. paper. Yep. So, you know, through one view, this advent of digital photography was a threat to every step in the Kodak value chain. Yep. And Stassen talks about how he, in desperation, was running around the company trying to get people to understand that this thing was more than just about taking pictures, that it might mean that someday you could send pictures through the phone lines. Now, today that's almost comical, right? But if we think about it, who better than Kodak to reimagine what photography would ultimately become? But what happened was that adversity fear paralysis cycle and getting trapped in that cycle. And Kodak did eventually go into the digital photography business, but by the time they did, it was too late. Their competition had an insurmountable lead, and you know, ultimately it leads to their bankruptcy. That's a great story, and it's such a true thing how that can, the fear, the paralysis of not taking action because of you know the unknown or whatever. It, is. And it makes me think, when you're telling that story, it makes me think of the car industry just a little bit with Tesla and electric cars bingo, and like, I see some plants around Indiana. We have some big manufacturing plants. I'm like, where are your electric cars? Like, I mean, I'm for both. I think they both have their place, but I have a story about the car industry. Yeah. I'd love to hear because I'm like, if you guys aren't going to get in this, then you're going to miss out. Yeah. So this happened recently. So it's very interesting. I have a very good friend who's another consultant and he was going out to do a workshop in Northern Michigan. And they were staying at this really beautiful conference center that was actually owned by the UAW. And he was told, before you go, if you rent a car, you have to rent an American-made car. And it can't just be American-made. It has to be manufactured. And when you get there, they will check the VIN number. And if it is not an American-made car, you will not be allowed to park on the premises. And he's another New Yorker. He's like, what? you got to be kidding me. So anyway, he calls up the rental agency, which is nearby, and he says, so I, you know, I'm going there and I need to, and the fellow at the rental agency says, oh, you don't have to worry about that. We don't have no foreign made car scrap here, (laughs) except he did not say the words foreign made. What he used was a racial slur that is used against Asian people. So now in addition to, you know, the horrendous mindset to use this language on a call, with a customer, no less. Let's analyze this a little bit. So what you have said is, we are feeling uncomfortable because of foreign competition. Therefore, we do not want you to park those cars on this premises. Now, could you think of a better example of adversity, fear, paralysis cycle than that? And I want to be very, very clear. I do not say this to be anti-union. I'm actually a very, very big fan of organized labor. I think labor organized labor is incredibly important. I think labor unions are incredibly important to protect workers' rights. But this is an example of how even a virtuous organization can fall victim to this adversity, fear, paralysis cycle. And in fact, the cycle is all around us. We see it in organizations, two of which I've just spoken about. We see it with individuals. When people get promoted, they may micromanage because they're afraid of letting go, which causes them to be a suboptimal manager. We've all had friends who may have gotten themselves into a bad financial situation or be in a bad relationship, and you see them make one mistake after the other, and they might say they're trying to dig themselves out, but in truth, we know they're just making the hole bigger and bigger. And so this cycle is all around us. And the fundamental part of what I call the thriving mindset is learning how to break that cycle. And then there's another nuance that I think we're very bad about teaching people. And that is that there is nothing wrong with being afraid. It is what you do when you're afraid that matters. So you can learn to use that fear that naturally comes with adversity 
as a kind of springboard to leapfrog out of adversity and into opportunity. You can learn to recognize that that fear is a signal to you that you're also standing in front of an opportunity. And the key to this thing I call the thriving mindset is learning to recognize those moments and then prepare yourself so that you can take those leaps out of fear and into opportunity. And I call that making a courageous leap. And thriving in the face of disruption is all about making those courageous leaps at that opportune moment. Yeah, I worked in a car manufacturing plant previously and my father is big in it. So I, I see it and I'm like, guys, so the paralysis, that all that, that circle, all that I've been in firsthand seeing it. And it's crazy to, I guess I try to be a visionary, see bigger pictures, see the possibility and, you know, take everyone's viewpoint on things. And so, but yeah, that reminds me with that, you know, I see deer and possum out here in Indiana and, you know, they're the animals that like they get in the road and they fear <laughs> freezes them and it to their yep. demise. And yes, it's like, I don't want to be that. That happens with human beings. Yes. That happens with human beings as well. I'd rather be the bear, or the wolf that gets in the position of maybe it's fearful of like a human or something, but it's either going to make a tactical escape to protect itself or it's going to go head at it and do the best it can. And it's like those kind of the different grouping of animals, you know, prey or predator type thing going forward, it can change your outcome. It can. And I believe it's about the preparation that we put into it. You know, we talked earlier about my path and you mentioned, you know, I was born into an area where people typically don't get opportunity. And, you know, sadly, it's much worse now than it was when I was coming up you know, the roads to opportunity have been narrowed. But one of the most important that I speak about all the time is education. It is the single most important thing. And, you know, in this highly disruptive world, I think we need to take a different view on education than we have traditionally. And in fact, I don't even call it education anymore. In my book, and when I speak about it, I call it cultivating intellectual capital. And I think about intellectual capital in four layers, and it's very at odds with our traditional view of education, because traditionally we said that an an education was something that you got, you know, somewhere in between the first 18 to 25 years of life, depending on what you chose to do. And it would provide you with the skills to make you productive and employable for the next 30, 40, 50 years, however long you, you intended to work. In the world we live in today, that is no longer a realistic proposition. There is no way that you will get skills in the first 18 to 25 years of life that are going to make you productive. So instead, we need to tease it apart and think about it differently. So the first layer of that pyramid is foundational knowledge. Okay, so that's what we get in a high quality education. It's math, it's arithmetic, it's science, it's those basic foundational knowledge pieces. And we're not doing a great job of teaching those things, but that's not nearly enough. Layered on top of foundational knowledge is critical thinking. You know, we talk about critical thinking all the time now, particularly in industry. Critical thinking, if you boil it down, is the ability to use foundational knowledge in novel situations. And that's important now because you will typically have to use your foundational knowledge in knowledgeable situations. When I think about this, I sometimes go back to undergrad. So my bachelor's degree was from Cornell University, and it was in electrical and computer engineering. So a long time ago, and it's a long time since I've been in engineering. (laughs) Technology has changed quite a bit. But one of the things we used to joke about in engineering school, in Cornell engineering school, was if you saw a particular problem on a homework assignment you would never see that problem again on a test. You could cross it off because on the test was going to be a different application of the same principle. And part of what they were trying to evaluate was, did you even understand the principle well enough to identify it when you saw it in an unconventional setting? And it was challenging, but what they were doing were developing critical thinking skills. And that's one of the things that you know, is in short supply today. The next layer on that pyramid is social intelligence. So as we said, you know, we have a shrinking world. I run a company of one and I collaborate with people from around the globe. I've had, you know, designers in India. I have technology people in China. I've like literally a business of one, a solopreneur these days is a global enterprise. 
That means that you need the ability to work effectively with people from other cultures and from around the globe. It's now become critical. We need to work towards and elevate those abilities actually in the average American. And then the final layer on this pyramid is self-education. So that is the understanding that whatever foundational knowledge you acquired, no matter how high quality that may be, is not going to be enough. And that you will need to constantly build more skills such that you can remain productive and competitive in an ever-changing world. And that's just part of the deal. There is no such thing as sitting on your laurels anymore. You will always have, and you have to learn to value that process of lifelong learning. So that's one of the fun, that notion of creating that pyramid of intellectual capital, I think is one of these foundational things to set you up to take those courageous leaps at those critical moments of disruption. You love listening to podcasts, but have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? Maybe you want to build a brand, grow your business, or are looking for an excuse to talk about your favorite hobby. Whatever your reason for making a podcast, Buzzsprout is the place to start. Since 2009, Buzzsprout has helped over 300,000 people launch their own podcasts. Buzzsprout walks you step-by-step -step through the whole process and will give you powerful tools to start, grow, and monetize your podcast. Ready to get started? Click the link in the show notes to get our free step-by-step -step guide to starting your podcast today. Yeah, I think that's a good point you make there too, because it's almost like being well-rounded, you know, being able to do all that, problem solve, connect and, and build relationships with people all around the world, and then just continue to learn as we go. And, you know, my wife's a teacher, she's in the school system, and we talk about this all the time, like, our school system, you know, it does the bare minimum, quote unquote. I mean, they're doing their best with, I mean, there's so many things coming out. We underfund <laughs> education in this country. American yes. students on average rank 27th in science and math among global students. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's a problem. <laughs> it is absolutely. And it just so much bureaucracy now that just red tape. So it hinders the foundational learning of these kids. And then, I mean, they're taking away those aspects to help them learn problem solving, learn those social aspects. I mean, with the arts being defunded in some places and things like that, there's so much that's just hindering that and almost regressing, I feel like, in that aspect where we need to be really, like you said, building this pyramid more. The world's getting smaller, but I feel in some aspects of it because of, you know, everything going on. We're becoming less relational, which is causing in a the lot United States. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, in our, <laughs> we, yeah. We live in a global ecosystem and it's not this way everywhere. <laughs> so that, which is a really important wake up call that, you know, we do live in a global ecosystem now, you know, students in school now will need to compete globally. And when you rank 27th, well, <laughs> that, <laughs> right. that, that's, that's, that's going to be a problem. You know, the other thing I think that's important to think about as we talk about these things, because I think the economics around this are very important. I'm, I'm straying beyond business here, but I do think there's an important connection. It depends on where you go to school. So one of the reasons that my life turned out to be the way it did was I was very lucky and I got a scholarship to a private junior high and high school. Changed everything. So it's really high quality education. And, you know, the Delta between what a child will experience in the average public school system versus the elite private school system is unbelievable. And it's much bigger now than it was when I was in those systems. So it is possible, but it does take funding and will to create this level of education. And that is the foundation. But, you know, this is just one thing. And we're talking about like, you know, kids who are kind of at the beginning of their careers here, but there are more things to talk about, like as you move through towards making these courageous leaps. And as we, you know, it's also important for leaders, like one of the things I talk about is, you know, out of the box thinking, how do you instill that in your company when you are a leader and you've got what you got because you always have that choice? Do you get caught in that adversity, fear, paralysis cycle, or do you enable your team to make those courageous leaps? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's huge to being, like you said, this whole thing, just being adaptable is allowing that space you know, to think of outside the box ideas. And 
I think those moments or that ability to do that or being allowed to do that has spawned so many amazing things as we've improved in life and as, you know, technology advances and things like that. It's because of those. And so if we could do that more and kind of with pencil leadership, like everyone has a purpose and has passion and has a strength. Like we did that in individual lives. Like we allowed ourselves that space to think outside, you know, the normal, whatever that is. I just can't imagine all the advancements and the positivity that could come from that. And I think that is true, allowing ourselves the space. And then also when you think about leaders, it's about creating the environments where that happens. So I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, out of the box, what does that mean exactly? And here's what I've come to believe. I think that this box we talk about is actually a metaphorical box of behaviors. So they are behaviors that keep your thinking boxed in and that lead to behaviors within the culture that turn into limitations. So they are behaviors like closed-mindedness. They are behaviors like different types of fear. There are behaviors like a lack of curiosity. Because then when you get cultures that engage in those behaviors, that's where you're getting, well, you know, this is the way we've always done it. No, you can't possibly do it this way. No, 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 we can't possibly make electric cars. Oh, no, we cannot possibly have a society that runs in that way. And the key for leaders is to pivot those environments and to create environments that encourage your people to think out of the box. So the key one is that closed-mindedness needs to be turned into curiosity. How do you lead in ways? What are the ways that you demonstrate leadership? such that closed-mindedness turns into curiosity. And, you know, Chris, one of the things I will get is, you know, I'll get clients coming to me and saying, yeah, yeah, Jerry, we need more of this out-of-the-box thinking. You know, I really need you to give me some tools or train my people to think out of the box. You, consultant, come in, train my people to think out of the box. And a question I will always ask is, well, you know, before I go in, tell me one thing. Tell me how you guys deal with failure. Now, I'll invariably get an answer that sounds something like, oh, we don't fail here. No, no, <laughs> failure is not, not an option. To which I say, well, that's why you have no out-of-the-box thinking. Because without that notion of what I call intelligent failure, it is not possible to have out-of-the-box thinking. And so you know, another way to make these courageous leaps is for leaders to set up environments where their people can make intelligent experiments. And one of the things that we need to do as leaders is to build the skills so that we help our people set up laboratories within the business. Because when we think about a laboratory, it has a very specific function. Because dealing with a phenomenon that you don't want to get out into the world at large, but you want to study that phenomenon and know about it before you decide you want to take it out of the laboratory. We can think about business as the same thing. You have a new product, you have a new promotion, you have a new idea. How do you help your people design experiments such that if that idea perhaps does not work, you come back with great learning such that you know, oh, you know what? It did not work this time, but here's the thing that we need to change in order to make it potentially work in the future. Or, you know, this is a really robust test. And what we've learned is we should never do this. This is never going to work well for the business. And then how do you as a leader celebrate that learning rather than punish the failure of the idea not working? That will pivot your culture into out-of-the-box thinking. I love that too, because like I said, there's so many brilliant people out there that have these great ideas that they just had the room to be able to, you know, tinker or, you know, try or the, you know, support to do that. I think so many great things would come and it, it makes me remember of a story. And I hope I remember this right, where Goodyear was trying to do something, create something again, I'm butchering the story, but end up basically creating rubber. I believe if the story serves me right in my mind from, you know, he was doing something else. He was, he was testing some things and it, overcooked or something happened but it created rubber and that's how you know rubber came about so it's really? the same kind of thing and don't hold me to that oh, i will research it i'm now i'm thinking that's a good story i want that one yeah i hope that's right because i remember hearing it something like that but it's like in those moments like if we have room to fail to mess up like that can be the next step to something great and, and so seeing those failures as long as you've designed it as an intelligent experiment and that's it's a matter of so sometimes, you know, we run into these leader situations where, you know, there will be marvelous success. And then if you ask, well, what did you learn from that success? There's very little learning. 
There are other situations where you might have a, quote, failure, but the learning from the failure is quite robust, and the organization can benefit from that learning. One of the things we need to do as leaders, part of that support is pivoting to that type of organization where there is intelligent failure. How do you mentor your people so that they're taking these experiments? How do you set up reward structures so that people will be incented to take these and to make these intelligent experiments. I think those are the types of things, those are the things that I tend to work with leaders on. How do you, what are the behaviors that you as a leader need to demonstrate yourself such that you can instill what you want in your organization? That's awesome. So one of my big goals with pencil leadership is to know somehow get into school systems, the public school systems and create a space for kids to maybe go after some of their passions. Maybe they are like, you know, a podcast might be cool to do, or maybe, you know, whatever they can't do in school or like art and bring in people to, to kind of mentor and guide in those aspects, but allow them that space to try, you know, okay, let's start a podcast here at your school. This is how we'll do it. You raise funding, all that stuff and give them that space because that could be what they're created to do. Or that could be their thing. Yeah. Could be incredible things. It is important to experiment with things while you're young to build that process. I completely agree with that. Yeah. So this has been a really good conversation and just a lot of good takeaways. And we could probably talk for another couple hours on this, which is amazing. And we'll have to bring you back for a couple more episodes, but kind of wrap things up through everything you've talked about today, you know, fifth trait of pencil leadership is that we're all created uniquely with a purpose to leave a positive mark on the world. So when everything is said and done for you, Jerry, what do you hope your positive mark is? I hope that I've helped create more people who can thrive in the face of disruption, because I think that's what we need. And I think some of the biggest challenges we have now as a country and frankly, as a species are driven by people being locked in that adversity, fear, paralysis cycle and people acting in really inappropriate ways out of that fear. And it's quite dangerous. So my hope is that I will help create more people who individually, collectively and societally can thrive in the face of disruption. Awesome. Such a good goal, such a good mission, and you're definitely doing it. And it's great to be connected, having you on the show. Before we say goodbye, where can people connect with you, find out more about what you're doing, and maybe seek out your help if they need it? Absolutely. So you can find me, go to my website at jerryvalentine.com. That's Jerry with a G, G G-E-R-R-Y, V-A-L-E-N-T-I-N-E.com. Jerry Valentine, Valentine like the holiday. If you go to my website, you can also find my book, which is The Thriving Mindset, Tools for Empowerment in a Disruptive World. You can buy that on Amazon or anywhere where you like to buy your books. If you go to my website, you can actually download the first chapter free as my gift to you. And I also invite people to connect with me on LinkedIn. So just look for Jerry Valentine, G-E-R-R-Y. V-A-L-E-N-T-I-N-E on LinkedIn and, you know, happy to accept your connections and you can see my articles and other things that, that I'm interested in there. Well, yeah, everyone make sure to check out what he's doing on his website, connect with him on LinkedIn, get his book, just a lot of good information and a lot we got just in this short episode. So I'm looking forward to just staying connected, Jerry. And again, thank you so much for being on Pencil Leadership today. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Chris. It's really been a pleasure to be here. And thanks so much for tuning into this episode today. If you found value at all from this episode, please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It just helps us get this show, these messages out in front of more people. And don't forget to share this with someone who you think could benefit from listening to as well. Now let's go out and be pencil leaders.